Welcome back to the Shema podcast, my friends. You know, there's something I did not mention to you in the past. I have mentioned that when my learning began, the very first thing I learned, I came across this website at Aish called Jewish Pathways. And I told you, I the very first text I studied was The Way of God by Ram Kahl, which is a great, I think, platform, foundation for your learning because I learned everything and the reason and the how and the why an infant internal creator created this world, all its dimensions, all the way down to mankind and specifically the Jew, the overall reaching 30,000 foot view framework of why we're here and why Dan Coleman was here back in 2008, 2009. But the second text I read through Jewish Pathways, where I got the text and it sort of brought you through with the author of the book providing videos and explaining everything was a crash course in Jewish history. It was perfection. I know rabbi in my life. I didn't know this community where I live now was here. Or the rabbi Wolbys were here. I was just leaving it up to Hashem to guide my curriculum. And it was perfection because after reading Ram Call, now I'm reading and learning from Rabbi Ken Spiro how all this actually took place over time. So it was, it was perfect to read this text because now I'm seeing everything looking backwards in time and exactly the way the Ram Call said it should go. And that's why I'm so excited to have Rabbi Ken Spiro on with us. And it's perfect too the way it laid out because last episode I did an episode called Escape from the Exile of Edom. And I got that title from a movie I watched as a young boy called Escape from Alcatraz. It had Clint Eastwood in it. And it's, a, it's a, about a true story where he's in his prison cell in Alcatraz. And he realizes that the stone that was keeping him trapped in his cell had become weakened by the salt waters. And so he began a journey of slowly, methodically chipping away at his cell taking the remnants of what he chipped away, putting it in his pocket, bringing it outside when they let them outside and dropping it off and just methodically chipping away at it a little and a little every day. I think that's basically, that is our pathway to remove ourselves from this exile of Edom that we're in. However, they had an advantage. You know what that is? They knew they were in a cell. I didn't for the longest time. Most of us today don't. Our captor is our Yetzirah, our evil inclination. And he has so much armory now to keep us locked in because we're in a cell and we got a big high definition TV, streaming media, an iPhone. I mean, we're comfortable in there. And whenever we start to ask questions and think, is there a greater purpose to my life? What does it mean to be a Jew? What is my Torah actually saying? The Yetzirah can say, hey, 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 look at what Netflix is saying. It says, because you like that last movie, you'll really like this other one. And don't forget about politics. What would happen in the world if you didn't know every piece of the Shon Haral that one politician said about another? And you got to support your favorite sports team. I mean, come on, you got to stay. I mean, it just keeps us distracted. And there's another great book I read by Rabbi Spiro about six years ago. It's beautiful. It's called Destiny. And what he laid out in that book was that the story of the Jewish people over history and the story of each of us follows the same story arc as a superhero. And I actually invoked this last week. I had a listener reach out to me for the first time and said, okay, I'm in Adam. Now what do I do? I know I'm here. And I said, you need to get a rabbi. And I invoked this whole idea because a lot of people think getting a rabbi means, okay, I'm going to listen to some lectures and they're going to tell me everything I'm doing wrong. And I, so I, I put in the email, I said, you were like Luke Skywalker in the first movie back from the late seventies. You knew that you've always known there's something different about you. You know, you have a greater calling. And now that you recognize that you got to find your Obi-Wan Kenobi, because that's what a relationship with a rabbi is really about. I mean, Rabbi Yoko Fulby, when I sat down with him the first time, he said, okay, what do you want to learn? And I said, well, I've learned the Torah is true. I learned we're supposed to do 613 mitzvahs. So I printed them off on a spreadsheet. I want you to spend the next few months teaching me how to do all these things. And he said, well, let's just focus on one. And when he said like, well, why don't we start with kosher? I said, Rabbi, I'm already ahead of you. I'm already keeping kosher. 
And he was like, wow, okay, that's amazing. I was like, yeah, I stopped eating bacon on my cheeseburger months ago. And what he knew, and this is the why it's so important to have your spiritual guide is he didn't say, Dan, you are the furthest thing away from eating kosher. Instead, he held back the truth to tell me, Dan, that is amazing. That's incredible that you've accomplished that. He built me up with that. And then when he said, how about learning the laws of Shabbos? I said, once again, Rabbi, I'm ahead of you. We've been lighting Shabbos candles every Friday night before dinner, and we watch TV for months now too. He said, Dan, there's there's a few more things I want you to learn about that. And he talking about the law prohibiting from the creative act of building something, of creating electrical current. But what he told me was so important. He said, Dan, I want you just this Shabbos to not use your phone. Don't even think about doing it the next Shabbos. Just this Shabbos, your phone, your computer. And see, what he was teaching me was how to navigate my Yetzirah, to fly under the radar. He was showing me how to chisel slowly and methodical at a pace appropriate for me to get myself out of that cell. And so my friends, I'm going to bring on Rabbi Spiro now. We're going to, we're going to expand more on those concepts that I discussed last week. And I am so excited. I mean, think about this. I mean, the first rabbi I learned from was Ram Kaul, Rabbi Luzoto. And unfortunately, I will not have him on until after the resurrection. But look forward to that episode. But I do have the second rabbi, the very second rabbi I ever learned from. And we're going to explore and get so much more clarity about where we are in Jewish history and our role and your role in our world today. Welcome to the Shema Podcast, the podcast for the perplexed, where Torah insights intertwine through personal stories as well as interviews with leading Torah scholars demonstrate the empowering qualities of Torah and mitzvot. For more great Torah learning through Torch, the Torah Outreach Center of Houston, go to torchweb.org. Now to the show. Rabbi Spiro, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. Well, I'll, I'll tell you where I want to start with. So I explained last week how I talked about Esau and, and his whole mindset was he learned Torah from his father and grandfather, but he had the mindset of, I believe in Hashem. I believe what my father and grandfather are telling me, but I don't believe in myself. I don't think I can change who I am as a result. So he continued to act in the same way and how the other exiles of Babylon and Persia and Greece, how they sort of took away different things, starting with the Babylonian empire, taking away our physicality, killing us, and then Persia taking it with our emotions and trying to get us to pursue lust. And then Greece with the intellectual idea that knowledge is to build up the ego versus Torah wisdom, which is to become more humble. And then how Adam in Rome sort of took pieces of that and how it's really a mental exile. And I would like you to expand on that, but also get more into where Ishmael fits in on this. Because I just left it that Ishmael is being used by Hashem as a stick to sort of wake us up from our exile at him. But I know with all these things, you can provide so much more clarity on, on where we are in history and how, and, and really, I think this is all by grand design, where why it was done this way and what the rectification is and all these, basically this dual battle, external with Ishmael and internal with Esau. So I'll turn it over to you, Rabbi. Oh, that's a tall order. You put a lot in there. That's... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, first of all, then there's a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of ways of understanding, you know, the world. There's the metaphysical level, there's the physical level, and they're always connected to each other. Because this, you know, the entire physical universe is a projection of God's infinite consciousness. So it's not a matter of either or. It's a matter of looking at it on different levels. But on the deepest level, they're always related to each other. And, you know, the one basic concept that I don't know what you covered previously, but we we have to understand that, you know, the whole purpose of creation is, is, is a relationship with God, not just for us, for humanity. That God is infinite. Infinity needs nothing. He creates a world so that he can give. The ultimate thing that God can give is connection with him. That's the highest level pleasure, as we say, so to speak. And through a whole series of events that take place in the early narrative in the Bible and in early human history, we see that humanity basically blows it. You know, Adam had, we talk, you talked about keeping commandments. Adam only had one. 
<laughs> don't eat from the tree. And not only did he eat from the tree, he then blamed his wife. We've been suffering from that one for a long time, us men. You know, and Noah, <laughs> so that we, we, the whole purpose of creation is lost. The world degenerates into idolatry. And yeah, you don't help God, you don't hurt God. This is such an important point that we don't understand. Infinity needs nothing from us. Okay, God doesn't need us to keep kosher for him or pray to him and tell him what a great guy he is. And, you know, the world can declines until we get to, and this, by the way, another thing we see, speaking about the connection between the, you know, ideals and values and the physical world, this is a direct connection, history shows, between our connection with the big guy upstairs and how we treat each other. You can't separate the two out, which is why the Torah is a great holistic system that gives us commandments that deal with our relationship with God, the spiritual stuff, like when you're talking about kosher and Shabbat, but also the physical stuff, property, ownership, damages, marriage, divorce. It's all holistically in there because it's all part of this system that the creator of the universe designs for us to adhere to. And, you know, when we blow one, the other tends to go. When our relationship with God is lost, our relationship with each other and humanity also gets lost. And that's exactly what happens. We have that Noah's Ark story, which is a very heavy story where God says, basically, use the world correctly or lose it. He wipes out the world, sparing only Noah, hoping he'll repopulate the world with people who have a relationship with him. But Noah's not successful. It's a great lesson for us also that he's proactive enough to save himself. Like he's on the lifeboat, but he's not proactive enough to take responsibility for the world, which is a huge lesson. You can't just be on the lifeboat and let everyone else drown. We're all in this together. And we finally get down to that Tower of Babel where humanity unites for all the wrong reasons, which is to rebel against God. And just when it all looks like, forget it, maybe God's going to give up and nuke the universe. Along comes one guy, Abraham, and he dedicates himself to this unique mission, you know, which is the ultimate, which is really the mission of the Jewish people since Abraham's time. He's our great grandfather, which is to reconnect humanity back to relationship with God. And we have, we now have a plot rewrite. So before we can go into, you know, Esau and Yishmoel and all, we have to, we have to have, I always say, you got to see the forest through the trees. Right. It's right, like when you do a jigsaw right. puzzle, you want to put the, when you pour the pieces on the table, you first do the frame because that's the easiest thing to spot. Then you fill in all the details after. So the frame we have to understand, anyone listening, is that the original plot of the whole story of creation was humanity has relationship with God. And we hang out in the garden, so to speak, as we say in 1960s California slang, and we groove on the Shekhinah. We just hang out in God's presence, but humanity fumbles it. But Abraham eventually picks up the ball and runs with it. And we have a plot rewrite, like sometimes in Hollywood movies, the end isn't good. So the director pulls the release date, reshoots the end. This is the ultimate plot rewrite. And the the new plot rewrite is humanity returns to God. Jewish people lead the way. That's the story, not just of Jewish history, but of all of human history, because God is the God of all humanity. And we chose for ourselves, which is what chosen people means, which is a concept which a lot of people have heard about, but almost no one can articulate. We're not chosen for any kind of privilege. We're chosen for a very unique responsibility that we inherited from the founder of our very old family business called Judaism, which is to reconnect humanity to God and elevate the world to the highest moral, spiritual level humanly possible. That's the plot of all of the story. And everyone is in the story, by the way. It's not just the Jewish story. Like on, the, on a movie set, there's no people running around the set who aren't there. Some people are the lead actors. Some people are the supporting actors. Some people are the bit parts. Some people are the walk-ons. But everyone's in the story. So this is relevant to anyone listening, Jewish or not Jewish. And so, so we understand that we have Abraham. We have, if you follow the narrative in the Bible, which is where you're talking about, you're talking about the roots of all of these different relationships with Yishmael, Yishmael, who is, who is Isaac's half-brother, Abraham, you know, his wife, Sarah, they're married a long time, no kids. So she goes and this is something we don't do today. It's called polygamy. You know, take a second wife. I always say, what's the punishment for polygamy? You get two mothers-in-law. But, uh, <laughs> but he, gives, he gives, Sarah gives Abraham a second wife, a maidservant, Hagar, an Egyptian princess. And from that relationship comes another child. With this is before Isaac is born. Abraham's, you know, child through his wife, Sarah, who was barren into her 90s. It's a crazy story, you know? And uh, that relationship creates Ishmael, who will be the progenitor, the, the creator of the Arab peoples and an offshoot faith that comes out of Judaism later in history called Islam. So that's one, that's a huge thing. That's like a major right. like branch of a tree coming out of that thing. But right. then we, we fast forward to Isaac, you know, Isaac is born. And God says to Abraham, even though, even though Yishmael is your firstborn son, and in, mid, and in Jewish law and Middle Eastern custom, the firstborn gets the family business, which is monotheism.org.com and .edu. 
uh, which is he, he's bypassed because he doesn't have the right stuff because right. to make the Jewish people requires the spiritual internalness of the woman of Sarah. So then Abraham eventually miraculously, which is a whole huge like point being made at the beginning that the creation and perpetuation of the Jewish people from the first generation until today has always been supernatural. Also too, Hashem blesses Ishmael and grants them his nation. So it, it's a, like you said, his branch of the tree and descendants are a vital part, a necessary part of creation. Absolutely. And, you know, his name even is quite unusual. And if you read the story in Genesis and Breshit, the book in the Bible, it says, you know, an angel appears to Hagar, who is the Egyptian princess, who's Abraham's wife, Ishmael's mother. He says, behold, you'll conceive and give birth to a, a boy, which is great. She knows which color clothes, baby clothes to put out on the family WhatsApp group. <laughs> Yeah. And his name will be Ishmael. He's named in advance. That ends all arguments. And the name Ishmael means God listens. That's huge. Well, wow. he's a I, child of Abraham. He has, as we say in in in, in the in Middle Eastern terminology, protexia. <laughs> it's not what you know, it's who you know. God has he has God's ear, but he doesn't become the Jewish people. He's kind of shunted aside. Which, and again, there's a very famous, there's a very famous comment of a rabbi who lived in the 13th century. His name is Nachmanides, the Ramban. He lived in Spain. Not to be confused with Maimonides, the Rambam. I think sometimes they do this to us just to make it confusing. All right. But he has a great statement in his commentary in the book of Genesis. He says, the actions of the fathers are assigned to the children. That that which happens in the beginning of the story is the revealed pattern for everything that's going to come later. It's like you said, it just sets things in motion. They're going to reverberate throughout history, which is why it's so important to learn our history. Because as King Solomon said so beautifully, Ein chadash tachat shemesh. there's nothing new under the sun. Jewish history, been there, done that. And the patterns that happen in the beginning, especially in the book of Genesis, are setting, the, it's like making the grooves or the train tracks that the, the railroad will always travel on in the future. So this is a relationship that's established at the beginning that is very significant. This relationship between Yishmael and later, supernaturally, when Sarah's 91 years old, she gives birth to Isaac. He's going to carry the family name. He's going to get the family business, monotheism.org, .com, .edu, you know, because he's got the right stuff. Yishmael is shunted aside. And it's very clear without doing a whole super long class on this, that Yishmael is very dedicated to the idea of God. He's raised in the only monotheistic family in the world. We get no indication that he's not seriously committed to the idea, yet because he doesn't have what it takes he doesn't get, like a father's looking at his kids. Who's going to take over the family business? Okay, my firstborn son, he's got these qualities, but I see that the second son, I see for making this business be successful, he's got it. So I got to figure out how to like do this in a way it doesn't cause a family feud, but he basically gets pushed aside. And all the sources jump in all over this, the mystical sources in Judaism, talking about how because Ishmael is a son of Abraham, there's an idea in Judaism that anything you do right in this world, even if you're evil, if Adolf Hitler, his name should be erased, was good to his mother, he has to get some sort of reward for that. Even if he slaughtered millions of people and killed 6 million Jews. So he'll get the reward in this world. You know, God will give him something, but he ain't going to get anything in the next world. That's for sure. Ishmael, if he honored his father, you know, and he was, and he was a loyal monotheist, he's got to get a reward. And he's, and the, the idea is brought down that, yes, he will become a mighty nation. He'll have 12 princes that come from him. It's all echo. It's all mirroring what happens to, to the Jewish people later with Jacob and his 12 sons. All, any number of things are going to be his reward. God will listen to him. But there's a very interesting idea that is brought down in, in, the, in rabbinic sources, in the Zohar, in Parshat Vayera. The Zohar is the basic book of Jewish mysticism, which Jewish tradition attributes to a rabbi who lived almost 2,000 years ago, by the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And uh, it's a very esoteric commentary on the Bible, very deep. And he says, basically, that because Ishmael is a son of Abraham, because he was circumcised at age 13, by the way, whereas normally he gets circumcised at eight days old, but that's when God gives, you know, Abraham the commandment, your second born son Isaac circumcised at eight days old, he already missed up the chance to do Ishmael. So he does right. it at 13. He says, because he was circumcised, because he's your child, he has to have a reward. What's the reward he gets? He doesn't get to be the chosen, chosen people. I'm paraphrasing this statement in, of, of the Zohar, but he will get a portion in the land of Israel down here in this world, so to speak. And he will be able to occupy this land until the merit of his circumcision is gone. And it's interesting that he is circumcised at age 13. And you look at his descendants become the Arabs slash Islam, which we tend to use interchangeably. 
But the reality is Islam starts as a religion of nomadic Arabic-speaking people of the Arabian Peninsula, but it spreads to many other groups of people who aren't Arabs. So today, only 30% of the Islamic world is Arab, but most Arabs are Muslim. But the Muslims show up in the Middle East in the 7th century, in 638, they conquered Jerusalem 1,300 years ago. And they lose control of the Middle East, various Islamic dynasties, not necessarily Arabs, like Turks will control Israel and Jerusalem, but they'll lose it in, at the end of World War I. That's 13 centuries. Interesting point. So wow. here you see exactly as the Zohar is saying, for every year that Ishmael is circumcised before Isaac is born, you know, he reaches the age of 13, he will get 13 centuries of control of the land of Israel until the merit of his circumcision is worn out, and then the Jews will return. And that is exactly what happens. But he always, if you look at the sources, without doing the whole class on this, he is always angry that it's not fair. I was loyal. Why am I being bypassed? But if, but if we keep going to the next generation, Isaac marries Rebecca. And after also a dip, long period of time when she doesn't get pregnant, again, repeating the pattern of the creation or perpetuation of the Jewish people is always a challenge from the beginning until today. And then she gives birth to twins who are very different. And again, after he says, behold, her time to give birth, you know, came and, and there was twins in her womb. And one came out all like hairy and ready to go. His name is Esau. His, even, his name in Hebrew applies like he's a man of action. And grasping his heel is Jacob from, from the word heel in Hebrew. So the twins, I have twin girls, by the way, identical twin girls. And it's funny, funny with twins, whoever comes out first is the, is the older one. Even in the case of my twins, it's six minutes. And by the way, in Jewish law, same thing goes. Who gets the family business? The firstborn. Who gets monotheism.org.com and .edu? Esav. Uh-oh. But, so once again. Yeah, exactly. The difference is, is this case, they both have the same father and mother. So in theory, on a spiritual genetic level, they both have the right stuff, so to speak. But they're totally different. Esav, you get right away. This is why I'm so careful to read. And you read the Bible. If, I'm, if I was doing this with you and going through the court, I'd show you all the little hints of what's going on. How not interested in the family business, monotheism.org.com and .edu, Esav is not into it. He's an instant gratification, totally like an ADD hyperactive, very accomplished guy, a man of action, but doesn't have the right stuff. There's a very little, little story they interject into the narrative where at one point, you know, he comes home from a day of violence and hunting and his brother, Jacob, is making some lentil soup and he's hypoglycemic, you know, blood sugar levels low, he's irritable. He says, give me some of that. And his brother says, okay, give me the firstborn birthright. Like, give me the family business. And, and he's like, you know, I would have said, are you kidding? This is like lentil stew. It's got to have some meat in it, at least. This is like, you want me to trade the family right. business? And he says, no problem, take it. And the, and, the, and the Bible's language is, and he ate and he got up and he left like very, very succinct language. He despised the birthright. He doesn't want it. He doesn't want the responsibility because the Jewish response, it's heavy stuff being a Jew, you know? Right. You got to be the light to nations. It's not about like owning stuff. And he just right. wants stuff like Europe. And we, by the way, Europe, J Jewish tradition says just as Ishmael becomes the Arabs in Islam, so too Esau, his descendants, Although the tradition is a little less clear, the Arabs openly admit they're descended from Abraham. That They have it in their tradition too. But Judaism says that Esau's descendants will become basically Rome through a, ch a series of generations. And Rome, we know, eventually becomes much, 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 much later in history. First of all, the Roman Empire, which becomes Western civilization, which is bit, bit really built on that, with a lot of influence from Greece, Greek in their all, Greek culture there also. But also Christianity, the Roman Catholic Church. So look at that. And, and literally in the space of two generations, you have not just the creation of Judaism, the mothership, the mother faith, but two offshoot faiths that will come out of breakaways, like branches coming off the trunk of a tree that don't become the Jewish people. But nonetheless, without us, there wouldn't be them. But nonetheless, they're, they're, they're shunted aside for different reasons. The difference being with Ishmael, father of the Arabs in Islam, he seems to be a dedicated monotheist. Esau seems to be very much a materialistic kind of person. And all of this is going to reverberate throughout history. You talked about previously the exiles. And going back to, by the way, it's such an important point to understand that when bad things happen to us, the Jewish people, whether it's drought or whether it's foreign invasion, conquest and exile or dispersion, it's always on the deepest level because God runs the world, a byproduct of us failing in our contractual agreement with the big guy upstairs to fulfill our mission in the world, to be the nation that's a light to nations, to elevate the world. So we do the wrong thing. God says, eh, breach of contract. Okay, no rain. Eh, okay, 
I'll start to send people to whittle away at your country. And eventually, if you really don't listen and wake up, we'll just destroy everything and throw you out. So, and so different, different like, nations will be sent against the Jewish people throughout history. And it's so important. I say when I teach students, you got to learn to look at the world with Jewish lenses and Jewish software because this, this, this superficial, you were talking about watching the news. You got to, if you watch the news with Jewish software and Jewish lenses, it's like looking at the electromagnetic spectrum, but wearing glasses that can see more than just visible light. You can see the ultraviolet, the infrared, the X-ray, the gamma ray. If you look at the world with infrared glasses, it looks real different than visible light. So you got to start looking. I always say, you got to get that Jewish software in the brain to realize, yeah, sure. Uh, the, the first temple was destroyed two and a half thousand years ago by the Babylonians because we were a vassal state of the Babylonian empire and we rebelled. That's the geopolitical cause. But then when you look into the Torah, the rabbis give us the inside story and God gives us the inside story. It's because you didn't keep, you broke your side of the agreement and your ability to live in the land of Israel and live at peace and fulfill your mission is contingent on you, your keeping that system of Torah, which means having a good relationship with me and, this is such a big point, with each other. And we could fast forward to the destruction of the second temple you're talking about, which, which is the exile of Esau, because this is the Roman Empire. The geopolitical cause of the destruction of Jerusalem was we Jews, who were very indigestible to the pagan world throughout our history, whether it's when we lived under the Greeks, lived under the Romans, uh, we're very stubborn people, hard to govern. We rebelled against the greatest world power that ruled the entire Mediterranean. They destroyed our country, destroyed our capital city, burnt the second temple to the ground, and then exiled us to the four, to a few places that we spread and spread and spread. That's a geopolitical understanding. But again, the rabbis in the Talmud would tell us, no, it's because you were so busy fighting amongst each other that God, like our father in heaven said, my children, you want to kill each other? I can't stand to watch. I'll send someone to do it for you. So I have to say that when you look at everything you just said at the the level of responsibility that we have and the exacting nature of the way Hashem treats us and, and whether or not we're fulfilling that responsibility, it makes you look at Esau's calculation. I don't want that much responsibility. You can understand where he was coming from to some Absolutely. degree, right? Yeah. Absolutely. But also you have to understand that even if he doesn't want the responsibility, there's a sibling rivalry going here that transcends multiple generations. And, you know, you look at, if you fast forward to modern times, you know, Maimonides, the great medieval scholar, uh, he has a great, he has a great insight into Christianity and Islam. And I always say the way I'm paraphrasing Maimonides, who is such a brilliant mind, he says, you know, ideally there's the, you know, there's, there's the way it is the, and the way it ought to be, you know, what should have been, and this is count, it's called counterfactual history. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. You know, you look at history. What if this had happened differently? There's a, there's a series of books called what if they're great. If you love history, you love these books. Like, what okay. if Alexander the Great, the greatest military conqueror of all time, in my opinion, never lost a battle, you know, conquered the entire known world but until his men finally burned out after 10 years and refused to fight anymore. But what if he, the first ba battle he fights with the Persian Empire is at the, at the Battle of Granicus, when he, when he, with an army one-tenth the size, attacks the greatest world power, Persia. And he comes within one sword swipe of being killed by a Persian horseman until his bodyguard, Clytus, dispatches the Persian guy. But one sword swipe would have killed Alexander the Great and all of human history would have changed because the Greeks would never have conquered the Persian Empire. Greek culture would have never met Jewish culture. Hanukkah never would have happened. Liberal democracy wouldn't have been created. Science wouldn't have happened. Everything would have been different. What if the Japanese had won the Battle of Midway? What if the South had won the Battle of Gettysburg? That kind of stuff. So what if we had not blown it? You know, what if you know, we'd, Adam had gotten it right. We would have gone right to the Garden of Eden. And the Bible would have been one, one portion long. God created the world. We lived happily ever after. You know, Noah built a really big boat and he got, but he said, forget the boat. I'm just going to get the world to wake up. But what if we had entered the land of Israel with Moses as our leader, conquered the land properly, not having to do it through Joshua, built the temple right away and done it properly. None of this stuff would have happened. So it's all what ifs, what ifs, what ifs, what ifs, what ifs. What ifs. So, so. One way or another, because this is such an important thing to understand when you look at Jewish history, besides there's a deeper plot going on, is that all of human history is this incredible dance, or I would say chess game, between the infinite creator of the universe, God, who is always ahead of us. It's like deep blue, the computer. Once a computer beat a human being, there ain't no way humans ever be in a, beating a supercomputer again, the chess game. It's not possible. And God is a lot bigger computing abilities than a supercomputer. He says, you never beat God, but it's a dance. You can make a move and you can always push off the inevitable. It's always going to be checkmate, you know? So we always he, get to the end of the story. 
We're always right. going to get to the end of the story. Like humanity does get back to the garden, so to speak. But how quickly, how slowly, how painfully, how painlessly, the short path, the hard path, the long road, the easy road, that is where human free will comes in. So, so the, the, if it's God's will that humanity get back to God, you know, Abraham could have done it possibly, or we could have done it in after the book of Deuteronomy when Abraham, you know, Moses hadn't died and we took us into the land. But Maimonides commenting on all of this, he says, what's the purpose of Christianity and Islam, which are the offshoot faiths of these two other offshoot family members of the Jewish people? You know, they say you can't pick your, like that line, you can't pick your friend. You can't pick your family, but you can't pick your friends. You know, you also can pick your beer if you like. But the, um, it's, he's right. Maimonides says, that these faiths weaned what are today billions of people off of polytheism and brought into the collective consciousness of humanity two of the most transformative principles that there are that have transformed the world completely. Number one is the idea of one God and, hum- and therefore, and, and who, cont- who runs the universe and that history is a control process leading towards a destination. It's not like your faith versus mine. God is the God of all humanity and idolatry is ultimately all an illusion. And that's the that's the creation of these offshoot faiths that will convert these billions of people who used to be, who are descendants of a bunch of polytheists who believed in Olympus and whatever other pantheons they believed in. That's number one transformative idea. A, a unified spiritual vision of one loving God who interacts with creation is leading humanity to a certain destination of redemption and just as transformative, not on a, not on a spiritual level, but on a physical level, a moral ethical level is one God who gives humanity one absolute standard of morality which is called ethical monotheism. I'd like to add too, Rabbi, that the other thing that Christianity, I'm not sure about Islam, but Christianity brought to the world's attention is the idea of a Mashiach. So when Mashiach arrives, it's like, it's it's not going to be just us Jewish people knowing like, oh, we know what's happening right now. Like the whole world's sort of going to have a framework for understanding what's taking place. Yeah. Uh, By the way, Islam has it it also. It's called the Mahdi. Okay, great. Perfect. The difference, of course, is how, because they don't have, but they have kind of a offshoot of us. The, the, the correct version is ours, by the way. And it's not, right. not, being, not PC. You cannot be a believing Christian and believe that Jews and Muslims are correct. You believe that Jesus Christ is God's son. He died for your sins. And to believe in him is the only way to salvation and resurrection. And Muslims believe that the Jews got it wrong. The Christians got it wrong. And Muhammad is the seal of the prophets and he got it right. So me saying what I'm saying is not like nasty. I'm not going to denigrate other people's beliefs and tell them they're wrong and try and force them to convert. We never do that in Judaism. By the way, Judaism is the most accepting of the three faiths. Judaism says you don't have to be Jewish to go to heaven. The righteous of the nations of the world have a place in the world to come. We just have automatic club membership because of our great grandfather, Abraham. So we're the most open of all of these ideas, but they all have similar constructs to what we have. So they, they're not exactly correct in how they're doing it. And they don't recognize, and this is the real issue. They don't, they, they, if you look at the history of the relationship of Christianity and Islam to Judaism, because Christianity appears first in Islam, they both basically, it, when they came into being as major faiths, adopted an idea of, of replacement theology, right? which is God maybe chose the Jews, but the Jews got it wrong. So he rejected the Jews and chose us instead. And that's where, now, what do you see from that? And that's where you see the rivalry continues on. The rivalry still continues on. That really, on some level, even if Esau and his descendants are not as spiritual as Ishmael's descendants, you see that until today, by the way, look at how non-religious Europe is and how fanatically religious the Middle East is. I will say this, Rabbi, like the, the, when I was first starting to learn, I was at a conference in New Orleans and I, learned, I knew that a Jew was supposed to pray three times a day, but I had not started doing that. And I went into a store and while everyone was waiting in line, this man was Muslim, was on his mat praying. Like basically, I don't care what, it, I don't care if anyone's looking at me, they think I'm weird. I'm praying to my creator right now. And I thought, all right, if he can do that, I should start doing that. So like, th- there's a, a lot of what they do that's like, I mean, very profound and, 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 and correct. I mean, would you yeah. agree? I mean, yeah. They do. They have, they have aspects. Each of them has different aspects of the truth that they're closer to. The Islamic idea of one infinite, invisible God is definitely closer than the idea of a trinity. The Islamic idea of, of, of having a deed, because there are commandments in Islam, albeit just five, but having a legalistic faith where it is Sharia Islamic law holistically covers spiritual and practical laws, just as halacha covers spiritual laws like kosher and Shabbat and practical laws, like we mentioned before about property ownership and damages and sales and pricing and marriage and divorce. Christianity doesn't. It's a religion of creed, of belief. 
But what the Christians have way over Islam is that their Bible contains ours. That's a whole interesting, really interesting discussion. But to just finish the thought of Maimonides, he's basically saying the reason why these things, one way or the other, the world's got to back, get back to God. And if we, don't, if we didn't do it directly and quickly like we should have done maybe thousands of years ago, the purpose, he says, of Christianity and Islam, and I totally see this as a rabbi and a historian, is to wean humanity off of idolatry, to introduce the idea of a God who acts in history and an absolute standard of morality and a notion that all of human history is moving towards a finish line. But it's two, it's, it's two steps forward, but it's one step back because the step back, which goes to the very root of what you're talking about of exiles and Ishmaelite exile and Asab, is that they're saying, yeah, you guys, you Jews, you're basically right, but you blew it. So you're now long, you're no longer in the game. But then because we, we somehow stubbornly don't disappear and don't give up, the, our very existence is really annoying. It's like really annoying to them. On a, often on a subconscious level. Like, why are you guys still here? Christianity, by the way, had a big problem. When Jesus came along and didn't do what the Messiah is supposed to do, which is redeem the world, so they came up with the idea of second coming. Like, when I talk to Christian groups, I always say this, and I'm very, very open to speaking. I, I, I love talking to, like, evangelical Christians. They're, like, fantastic people. They got a tremendous sense of morality. They support Israel. They know their Bible. Right. I always say at the end, I go, guys, you know, we got to agree to disagree on a lot of stuff. And a lot of these groups are from Texas, by the way, a lot of them. And we got to agree to disagree on, on a lot of stuff, but we agree on a lot more than we disagree on the reality is. And we're fighting the same battle here, whether it's going to be, you believe in God and absolute morality, you're open to everything except the person who isn't open to everything, which is a lot of the crazy other side of the world today. But I said, you do, here's the deal. You do your job with Christians, make them more like good Christians, have them read the Bible and act accordingly. And I'll do my job on the Jews and we'll bring the Messiah. And if he's Jesus, I promise you guys can baptize me. That always ends the debate right there, you know? <laughs> so, uh, but we then could, I had to explain, why do you Jews, then why do the Jews continue to exist? If God reject, if, if God rejected the Jews for rejecting his son and they destroyed his temple because it's a punishment, then we don't need the temple anymore anyway, because the purpose of the temple is an atonement with animal sacrifice. And Jesus is the only sacrifice you have to believe in. He's the suffering lamb who died for your sins. So, oh, well, so they, why did you, why did you still survive? Oh, Teste veritatis, witness people. A couple of Jews have to survive. So when Jesus does come the second time. Say, I told you so. Then the Jews will say, aha, uh-huh, we were wrong and he's the Messiah. But you can see, you see, Dan, this still is driving them nuts. It's still driving them crazy in different ways. Because think about it. We are no threat to anyone. I mean, Israel, world power, the only Jewish empire in history has been Hollywood. And it hasn't been, <laughs> and Hollywood has definitely not been pushing the Jewish agenda for sure. Right. So, but our, our teeny tiny state of Israel, the size of New Jersey with Jews who are 0.2% of the world's population somehow is really annoying because on the deepest level, these, all these people are aware that you just like, we're always, we're always pushing at them. <laughs> you're not doing it right. By the way, the more off they are, the more, the more against us they'll be, which is why you get to a Hitler who's a pagan, by the way. He's going to go nuts on us. He is as opposite from us as you can get, you know, whereas people who are kind of close, which is why evangelical Christians who now take the Bible really seriously are so pro-Israel and very, and very, you know, very pro-Jewish. A lot of them or just for genuinely, they genuinely care about the Jewish people because they're, they're more, they got more skin in the game than a guy like Adolf Hitler who had no skin in the game. So it's a very complicated dance, which has been manifesting itself throughout history until today. But when you peel away the geopolitical realities, the rise and fall of the you know, Islamic world and the Roman Empire and the Europe as the European colonial powers, bottom line, that's just the top layer of paint. And you get to the struts and the wall there, you see the foundations of all this is much deeper, much more spiritual, much more metaphysical. So Rabbi, yeah. so what I would like you to clarify is, as I sort of started off in the intro with, is that there is this sort of dual conflict taking place at the same time. It wasn't like the previous exiles where we had one country take us over, they went away, another country, they took us over. Now we're, but we're back to the, 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 the core pieces of the branch that stem from Abraham. And we're sort of colliding with both of them now. One again, the Christians, for the most part, are, like you said, very supportive of the Jewish people. I mean, I see most Jews when they're trying to like support Israel, they uh, they support APAC. Most Christians will use the verse, the, the nations that bless you will be blessed and curse you will be cursed. So they support Israel. They want to support Israel for that reason, right? They know Hashem's involved. But how does this all sort of 
come together that these are all sort of coming to a climax now. Both these are cousins, basically. Yeah. So, you know, there's an idea of different exiles in rabbinic tradition, which we talked about that their roots of them go back to our relationship with God. But the geopolitical causes, we have the Babylonian exile, we have the exile, we have persecution under the Greeks, we have the story of Purim when we lived in exile under the Persians, when there's an attempted genocide going back two and a half thousand years ago, and the final exile that we still live in until today, even though the state of Israel has been reborn and this process is reversing itself, it's rewinding. The fact that in 1900, a half of 1% of the Jews in the world lived in Israel, and today half the Jews in the world live in Israel is crazy. In 1900, one Jew spoke Hebrew as his first language, Eliezer ben Yehuda's son, Ben Sion, who is the first kid raised speaking Hebrew as a modern spoken language. He had a terrible childhood, no play dates. You couldn't talk to anyone. And today, Hebrew is the first language of half the Jews in the world. We don't realize how supernatural this wow. all is. So, what we're, but we're still, but until all Jews are back in the land of Israel and we have a Jewish government, the whole messianic redemption concept, we're still in that exile which the rabbis say was caused you know, historically by a rebellion against the great superpower of Rome. But the deeper level, the Talmud says, was caused by causeless hatred of one in, in fighting in the Jewish world. We're literally killing each other off, fighting a civil war over how to deal with our enemies. And if you don't think that, you think that's crazy, look at the Jewish world today, how much energy we spend fighting amongst each other. But like I said, one way or another, we got to get back there because we haven't gotten our act together. We've stayed in that exile for 2,000 years. So we kind of, but there, but there's another in rabbinic thought, there's this idea also of, and it's interest, introduced by the way, much more recently in history, going back to the 16th century, Rabbi Chaim Vital, who lived in Sfat in Northern Israel in the Galilee, who is the main student of one of the great mystical thinkers of modern Jewish, remember modern in Israel is the last 500 years. <laughs> <laughs> Old is 4,000 years ago. Middle Ages is 2,000 years ago. <laughs> is a man by the name of Rabbi Isaac Luria, the Ari, great mystical Kabbalistic thinker who didn't write anything down. His main student, Chaim Vital, he says that in the end of history, Israel is destined to experience this fifth, a fifth exile, which is not mentioned in earlier sources like the book of Daniel, which is going back two and a half thousand years ago. The great ancient persecutors of the Jews, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, he talks about the Ishmaelite exile. The exile of Ishmael, which means the Arab Islamic world. I mean, it doesn't have to necessarily be Arabs, but Islamic, because Islam is a byproduct of the Arab mind, even though 70% of Muslims aren't Arab, that they're going to come against us. So I was thinking, I've done a lot of research on this. I literally have an entire presentation just on that theme, which is really interesting stuff. But I was thinking, wait, 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 wait. We have this idea in the Bible of, you know, the final exile, because there's no third exile going on, is being of Esau, which is Roman Christianity who have persecuted the Jews far worse than anyone else for the last 2,000 years, crusades and pogroms and you name it, it's unbelievable. Um, how can we have both? But the reality is, is it's not like, you know, two things can be true at once. Okay. And by the way, since the destruction and exile of the Jewish people 2,000 years ago, we have been numerically, we have been a stateless people at the mercy of other people on the sidelines. And what has happened that the offshoot face that came out of us, Islam and Christianity, whether it's majorly, primarily European civilization, although Christianity is everywhere now, South America and Africa and Islam is everywhere. It's in Indonesia, the biggest Islamic country in the world and in Pakistan and in India. But as faith wars, these two groups of people have been, have been duking it out literally for the last you know, 1300 years since Islam came into being with its jihad coming after Europe and Europe coming back with crusades. And so it seems like we're like on the side, Jews are like, we're down for the count on the side, like in the... Out of, the, out of the ring and they're punching each other out. But because if we rewind too, even us, the reality is, is we are at the center of the story. Even if we are seemingly insignificant on the deepest off its subconscious level, these great offshoot faiths are aware that we are still a player. Not only are we a player in a certain level, our existence and our mission is still at play and we're the bigger threat than they are to each other. So while they're going to constantly smack each other around and fight, they're gonna, they will get together for only one thing. And that is to come after us. And I just want to read you something from the Zohar for a second. This is a great quote. This is the, the right. basic book of Jewish mysticism from almost 2000 years ago, commenting on the book of Genesis. And it says, and it says, the children of Ishmael are destined at that time, meaning the end of days, where we are now approaching to incite all the nations of the world to come to Jerusalem together with them. As it is written, I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem for war which is an unbelievable idea that they hate each other, but what's the one thing that they can agree on? They hate us more. And you want to see this in real time? Go to an American university campus. 
go watch a body pierced LBGTQ leftist person walking arm in arm with a wearing a kafir around their neck from a radical Islamic jihadi guy who's screaming right. from the river to the sea together. What do these people have in common? What would the Islamists do when they took, if they take over, God forbid, America to the LBGT community, as we always say in Israel? Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah, queers for Palestine is like chickens for KFC or cows for <laughs> McDonald's. But the one thing they could agree on, even though the LBGT people is not a religious Christian, they wouldn't be behaving that way if they were. But, the, but on the deepest subliminal, it's often subconscious level, there, something about us is always annoying them. So they will put their, they, they, that, they will unite together to come after us. And this is exactly the biblical scenario laid out in Ezekiel and Zechariah, which is called the Wars of Gog and Magog, which is what we are in now, I firmly believe. The final struggle where the nations of the world line up to make one final attempt to stop the miraculous process that has taken place that because that we're living in the middle of it, it doesn't involve us, the suspension of the laws of nature. But the rebirth of Israel three years after the destruction of one third of the Jews in the world and the Holocaust, the fact that we have outlasted all the nations that tried to destroy us, the fact that we, despite having no political power of any kind and no empire, have transformed humanity's conscience in a way that very few people realize how much Jewish software is running in the, in the collective consciousness of, the, of humanity. The fact that Israel's is reborn, that's fought off its enemies, that prospers in the worst neighbor in the world, which is the Middle East, it's all supernatural. So we may not see it, but I'm telling you, if you just look at the theme in Zachary and Ezekiel about what they're talking about, forget the fact they're talking about horses and chariots and just put missiles in there instead. And boy, is that what the world is going on because they realize that our success is the ultimate discrediting of their beliefs and their values and that they're going to have to, even though they think that they replaced us, they're going to have to line up in back of us and they're going to have to follow us, our lead. We're not going to conquer the world. We're not going to suppress them. But by the way, in the Messianic era, there can't be Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, tree hugging animism. Everyone, there's right. no conversion to Judaism, by the way. The whole world will become Noahides. They, you can't convert to Judaism either by that point. The whole world becomes Noahides. They'll all follow the seven Noahide laws and they'll, they'll line up behind us and say, forget fighting against you. Show us how to do it right. That has been your job since the time of Abraham. But Yishmael particularly because he's the one, unlike Asaph, who is really a religious guy, like you commented about the guy who's rolling out his prayer mat in the middle of like some store and praying. He is the one who is really in our face. Geographically, he's our neighbor in Israel, but he's the one who's really angry because Asaph, he gave it away for the lentil stew. But everything that, is, that the is, Ishmael does until today, his descendants, is screaming to God, it's not fair. And I, just to end with this thought, it's very interesting. We Jews pray three times a day. So they pray five times a day. We, before we pray, we wash our hands. So they wash their hands and their feet. We bow at the waist when we pray. They get all the way down on the floor when they bow. You know, we keep kosher. They do halal. We pray towards Jerusalem. They pray towards Mecca. We, pass for, we fast for one day on Yom Kippur. They fast for 30 days on Ramadan. We have this idea of a pilgrimage holiday to Jerusalem. They have the idea of Hajj. You know, we dress modestly. They put their women in like complete full body covering. We right. taught the word about dying for your beliefs and they blow other people up for theirs. It's just like this extreme version. It's as if they're screaming until today, it's not fair. We've been bypassed. So what you see now swirling around us, which is why you got to have that tor those Torah lenses and the Torah right. software to see wow. what is really ultimately going on. Yes, geopolitical realities and radical Islam and Europeans professing Christianity, but not practicing anymore or whatever. Yeah. The real story, the real plot. You got to keep your eye on the ball as a general. You got to know where the real threat's coming from. And the real struggle is always about Getting, be the, being the God squad and showing the world how to have a correct relationship with God and with each other and elevating the world back to that garden. And then when we stop doing that, that's the messianic era. Then the world will stop fighting with us. They'll line up behind us and say, we see God's with you. Show us how to do it. And then we get unity and peace for humanity. Well, how do we resolve this with the descendants of Ishmael of Islam? Because understandably, Ishmael is angry at Abraham. Dad, look at me. I can do better. I can pray five times a day. I can do all these things better. Why didn't I not get the birthright? How is that ever going to get resolved? Because you know, with Christians, in the sense of Esau, they just they want to change our mind, like Greece. They just want to, we like you, just convert. But they, everyone around us, I mean, around Israel right now, just wants to get rid of us, just to destroy us off the face of the earth. It's the Hamas charter. Just, I don't care from Hamas's perspective. It's like, I don't care. And all these groups. I don't care if I have to kill my own children. I just don't want your children to live. How does that ever get resolved? I know there's some hints of it 
in the Torah, when Abraham dies and Ishmael sort of comes back, and I think there's some commentary that's sort of a reflection of in the times he does teshuva and he sort of comes back and unites again with Yitzchak. I, what you're focusing on is this, it says when, when Abraham died, it said Isaac and Yishmael bury him and nothing right. in the, the Bible happens accidentally. The fact that it mentions Isaac first, even though he's the second born, you know, the rabbis are always looking for how you understand this, that Yishmael is will come back and follow our lead. The problem with Islam today is, first of all, has been hijacked. Islam can express itself in, in moderation. It is not, by the way, a very moderate accepting faith. I'm not I'm saying it's not PC. There are moderate Muslims, but Islam is not really a very moderate faith. Their basic Islamic worldview about creating an entire world that lives under Islamic domination is far more extreme and an empiric and an empire-like and expansionist than Christianity ever was, by the way. So there's an issue there. There's also a deeper issue that we are living in the middle of their neighborhood, in a territory that was controlled by them for 1,300 years, which in Islamic worldview, based on their understanding of the world, that the world is moving towards an Islamic paradise, the house of Islam, the existence of us as a nation in the middle of what was an Islamic controlled piece of territory, which is the land of Israel for 13 centuries, is really, really, really annoying to them. And the fact that Jews who are viewed as dimmi, second class citizens in the Islamic world, are ruling over that country and even ruling over Muslims. I'm not talking about the so-called occupation, but even, even amongst Israeli Arabs is also unacceptable. So we, we present a much more real, clear and present like presence in their face in the Middle East. And also it's because Christianity has moved the other way in the last thousand years. They've lost a lot of their faith. I'm not talking about the evangelicals and hanging on Texas and Pastor John Hagee and all those guys. I'm talking about the average Christian doesn't is only Christian in 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 name and, and not in you know and not in practice anymore. Right. So Christianity's kind of chilled. Their problem is they're godless now, and that's a big problem too. Because when you when you take God out of the picture, the world goes in the wrong direction. Islam has is very godful, albeit in a very imbalanced and often violent, aggressive way. Not that all Muslims are like that, but you have these Islamic regimes led by Iran that very much are like that, which creates a huge imbalance in the world where you have very open universalistic Europeans who want to be open to everything being invaded by millions of extremely particularistic Muslims who view that we're coming in your country, we're going to outbreed you and we ain't assimilating. You want to assimilate us, we ain't assimilating. We'll just wait till we have more kids than you have and we'll just take over your countries and we'll finally do what we wanted to do all along without even fighting a battle. So there you got that. So that is the bigger problem. So, but both present a threat. A world without God is a world that you see the craziness of where people are, people are even questioning biological realities, like what is a woman? And a world with God without the morality that comes along with it that we get from the Bible, you get fanatical faith that is very uncompromising and aggressive and expansionist. And neither of these two groups are getting it. We're, that's why the Torah system, the commandments, or half those commandments are about your, your relationship with the big guy upstairs, and half those commandments about your relationship with your fellow human beings. And we, the Jewish people, how's it going to end when we Jews learn how to do it correctly? Because the Jewish world today has the majority of Jews who are assimilating and intermarrying at massive rates are, have Jewish software pushing them to want to change the world and to care and to be over accomplished like we are and get 22% of all the Nobel prizes since 1901 when we're 0.2% of the world's population, but have no Torah software directing that drive and that revolutionary transformative thinking. And then you have a lot of the Jewish world, which is hyper-Orthodox which is hyper obsessed on being super holy in terms of the relationship with God, super, keep super kosher, super modest, super Shabbos observant, but it's not, but it's kind of lost and very reactionary towards the fear of losing our children to that dangerous outside world. So they're also not being proactive towards their fellow Jews in the world. Meanwhile, the, the, the rest of the Jewish world is being super proactive towards everyone else, but their Judaism and the fellow Jewish people. So what, what we need is a balanced Jewish people. When we get Jews who have that relationship with God and with each other, who are Jews for Judaism, because Jews for Judaism make the best role models for the world, then we get the balanced nation. That's the light to nations. And then and only then, because if you do it right, people will follow you, which is why I say that a famous quote, imitation is the highest form of flattery. The shortest class you ever got on Christianity and liberal democracy. If it wasn't for us just doing it better, often in the worst circumstances, without a country, in exile, persecuted, but creating communities that higher standards of literacy and social welfare infrastructure and just more cohesive and just better off than everyone else, we wouldn't, I mean, the world wouldn't be where it is today. So, but we can't go to sleep now at the wheel. We got to wake up and focus our energy on what our mission is, which means the Orthodox Jewish world has to focus on, it's not just about staying religious, making sure our children are, it's about spreading the light to the world. 
And the non-Orthodox Jewish world has to recognize that you can't represent the Jewish people till you know what the Jewish people represents. We got to be educated and focused on that amazing energy on, like I said, Jews for Judaism. And then, then they'll stop bothering us. They will, just like Ishmael will come back and say, my brother Isaac, okay, you're right. I was the firstborn, but you're the leader in this family. Esau will say the exact same thing. Say, you show me how to run the business. You can be the CEO and I'll follow your lead. And we should see that soon because that's what Messianic Redemption is. Amen. Beautiful. Perfect. Rabbi, I appreciate you coming on and discussing all that. It's a great wrap up. It is a common theme that you know I've discussed on this podcast with various people is that when people claim that the Jews cause all the problems in the world, we have to say, you're correct. We fix the problems by being better Jews, being our, the best selves, following the Torah, learning it. That is how we solve it. And I think you really spilled it all out and, and showed us the, the fabric of history in the future. So we know the gravity of us accomplishing that today. So thank you so much. My absolute pleasure. So Rabbi, if people want to learn more from you, I know I mentioned a couple of books, The Crash Course in Jewish History, Destiny. I know you've written more. I know you have a website and a podcast. How can they continue to learn from you? Yeah. So first of all, I have a website, which is linked to everything. It's Ken Spiro, K-E-N-S-P-I-R-O.com. And that has links to my podcast and has a store on there, which will take you to the publishers of all the books I've written. It has a lot of my material online. You can listen, read, and watch for free. I do a podcast every week on current events in Jewish history. It's called Remember What's Next. It's on all the major platforms, you know, Spotify and Google and Apple and Anchor. And I also have a YouTube channel, Rabbi Ken Spiro, where you can actually watch the episodes and the shorts of all of my podcasts. Some people like to watch them as opposed to just listen. So, and I'm doing a speaking tour. I come to the States. My next one will be in November. Hopefully I'll be in, in Houston, I hope, from November 12th to the 24th. So it's not, my schedule isn't fully up yet, but I'm going to be in Norfolk, Virginia. I'm going to be in probably in the Valley, you know, in uh, North Hollywood in California. I'm going to be in hopefully Denver, Colorado and in New York in a couple locations. And I'll, pu- I'll post my whole schedule up on my website. And I know I have friends, you know, in different parts of the country. If they want to reach out to you and get you to come to their area of the country while you're here in the States, how can they reach out to you? Anyone can email me. It's real easy. It's kenspiro at gmail.com, K-E-N-S-P-I-R-O at gmail. And if you're interested, I'd be happy to. Now I'm in the process of just finding out who's interested, and then I create my schedule. And once that's done, that's, that's what it's going to be. I can't veer from that, but happy to go anywhere I'm invited to go. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Appreciate you coming on. Oh, thank you for having me. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider supporting Torch so they can continue to spread Torah wisdom to the world by making a donation at torchweb.org and clicking donate in the top right corner of the page.